Okay, welcome to the talk on female testosterone replacement. This is an issue that we've been dealing with for the past eight years in my medical practice, and it's something that we get a lot of questions about. There is a pretty strong bias in our medical community regarding women and testosterone. It's no different, though, than men having levels of estrogen, which we're kind of biased against that because estrogen is considered a female hormone whereas the testosterone is generally considered a male hormone. The interesting thing about that is in a healthy, vital female that's in their reproductive years, the amount of testosterone in their system is actually 10 times the amount of estrogen in their system when you look at the actual uh, quantitative value of the numbers. And yet we ignore the fact that testosterone diminishes pretty substantially as women age, especially after menopause and don't address those issues. So I'm here to talk about the different aspects of testosterone replacement in the female population, um, something we've, got, we've had experience with over the past eight years. Um, loss of testosterone in a female is responsible for a lot of the symptoms that we see in patients today. Issues with weight gain, issues with unexplained fatigue, with this brain fog, this, an inability to concentrate, poor memory, um, but typically what we hear is the woman will tell us it's, it's a brain fog. We see muscle loss. We see decreased bone mineral density, so women with osteopenia or osteoporosis, even in the younger population. We see always, uh, almost always, a substantial decrease in libido, uh, sex drive. Sex drive is a big deal, and not only do we see dysfunction with the libido, but we also see some dysfunction with the function of sexual uh, interactions. Just inability to have an orgasm, uh, inability to build to the orgasm, decreased pleasure in sex. Those are major issues that testosterone uh, plays a significant role in. Um, it's just, the way we put it is that the testosterone deficiency is associated with a decreased vitality. Vitality is essential. I mean, that's the thing that drives us through life. That's the thing that has us playing the game rather than sitting on the sideline and watching everybody else play. Women want to get that too. Men are getting it now because testosterone replacement in men becoming ubiquitous in our society. There's millions of men on testosterone replacement, but only several thousand females that are getting the testosterone replacement that they need. The interesting thing is this has been addressed in the past and ignored by a lot of the medical community. The, um, the Princeton um, consensus statement that was done in 2000, and it was a bunch of international um, endocrinologists, gynecologists, physicians that got together and said, okay, what are we looking at? What are the symptoms of female androgen insufficiency? And what they came up with was decreased sense of well-being or vitality, uh, fatigue, decreased libido or sexual pleasure, which is actually occurring in about 50% of females in the 18 to 60 year old category, uh, decreased memory, brain fog, decreased muscle mass, decreased bone density, sleep disturbances. Sleep is a major issue that we see corrected when females get their testosterone in a normalized state. Um, we also see increasing body fat percentages. And these were all things that they found in the, consen the Princeton consensus statement back in 2002. Unfortunately, the, the US FDA has said there's really not enough evidence at this point to say that there is a good female approved testosterone replacement. Other countries already have it in place, but the United States is, is kind of reluctant. And in fact, last year they turned down an application for uh, the female testosterone replacement patch. The thing is, they've, they've got one that's approved, EstroTest, which is an oral form of testosterone, which is actually toxic to the liver. So, you know, they're, they're saying that they don't approve of, of testosterone replacement in females, yet they have a drug that they approve of. Um, but again, the drug has different indications. It's not for a per se testosterone insufficiency or an androgen insufficiency in these females. Uh, when we get females on testosterone, what we see is we see a huge increase in, in self-confidence. That's a, that's a major one. That vitality, that feeling like I want to get out and do things again, uh, that drive, 
that they get back, the initiative. They have decreased anxiety, decreased depression. And we have so many females that come to us on antidepressant medication, and once we get their hormones fixed, suddenly they don't need the antidepressants anymore. So I think we're looking at a lot of females being placed on antidepressant and anti-anxiety medication when the true problem is the hormones, and we're just kind of medicating a symptom and you know, basically giving them a pharmacological lobotomy uh, so that they're tolerant of the lack of hormones rather than fixing the hormonal problem to begin with. We see a decrease in insulin resistance. I mean, who, who doesn't want that? There's an aspect of vitality of, of chronic good health. Decrease that insulin uh, resistance and get into an insulin sensitive state. So other than aging, what kind of things do we deal with that causes these androgen insufficiencies in the females? Well, the biggest one is, of course, menopause. Menopause, at that point, we, the, as females, uh, people, that are, the females lose 30% of their testosterone production to begin with, uh, right at menopause. And it, it's a fairly abrupt loss. The rest of the loss is a gradual loss. And it's, you're losing it leading up to that time, and then at that time, it's a substantial uh, increase in the loss. And in fact, when we see females that have postmenopausal symptoms, the studies have shown that you can put them on estrogen, yet they don't have a very satisfying response except when they're placed on estrogen and testosterone together. And when you're dealing with something that we're replacing something that was 10% of, or one-tenth of something else, the testosterone, 10 times the amount of estrogen. I mean, I can't repeat that enough. You know, the, the female testosterone component is huge, but we're focused on this hormone that's one-tenth of that, and yet I think it's uh, probably one-tenth of the response as well. Uh, oral estrogens, this is a huge one. Uh, birth control pills. Birth control pills is where we see this huge drop in uh, female testosterone in the younger age group. And the problem is the effects of oral estrogens last for years, five to ten years after it's stopped. And I'm going to go into that here in a little bit when I talk about the lab work, um, but it's pretty substantial. Anything that can increase sex hormone binding globulin, that's one of the things that the oral estrogens do, but there's other things that can affect that. Smoking, uh, alcohol, uh, certain medications, especially uh, like Synthroid. Synthroid's a big one. Stress, cortisol in, in a stress situation is a huge uh, component of increasing sex hormone binding globulin and decreasing the production of sex hormones. So not only are you decreasing production, but you're increasing the amount of binding that you have. Double whammy with stress. Uh, the medications uh, like beta blockers for blood pressure, uh, H2 blockers for reflux, uh, all will increase sex hormone binding globulin or decrease testosterone production. Uh, SSRIs are antidepressants, major inducer of uh, suppressing testosterone production in the female. Um, other hormonal issues, uh, bad thyroid. See, the thing is, all of our female hormones interact in a big symphony. They respond to changes in another section. So if you, you, know, you have the string section out of tune, it's going to throw the rest of the song off. And that's what happens. And then you start manipulating one section, it changes another. So it's a, it's a game to get all the hormones firing on the same key. And it's something that took me years to really fully appreciate how to do this. It's not something you can say, OK, well, let's just put somebody on testosterone and we're done. It doesn't work that way. Not only do we have to deal with the hormones, but we have to deal with nutritional components of that as well as fitness components of that. I always say that testosterone is kind of like the lighter fluid. You want a big bonfire, and you have all the firewood, and you can pour the lighter fluid on there. And it doesn't matter if you pour gallons of it on there or a little bit on there. If you don't strike the match to it, no fire. And that's what I tell my patients. You've got to make that effort with the nutrition and the fitness to get the full effect of the testosterone when we do that. So let's talk a little bit about the testing. And this is an area where we see a lot of misunderstanding, especially in the medical community with what we actually are testing when we test this stuff. Uh, we see this with the males, too, but it's more pronounced with the females. First thing 
we talk about is actually getting a testosterone level. Well, the testosterone level will not tell us the whole story. Because when we look at a blood vessel and we look at the testosterone molecules that float around in there, we have a bunch of them. And when we get total testosterone, what we do is we measure this whole component of the testosterone. But the problem is, over 95% of the testosterone is not really usable. So we're measuring 95% of this that, that we don't even need to look at. What we find is that sex hormone binding globulin, SHBG, which we talked about, is binding up over 95% of this testosterone. That means we've only got that much basically free to move out of the blood vessel and affect a cell and affect a target and create the response. So we can measure total testosterone. It gives us all this. But I always say it's like knowing this is the number of soldiers in your army, but these are the only ones that are armed. You want to know how many are effective. And that's where we look at free testosterone. So I only treat based on free testosterone. I don't treat based on total. I see people with really high totals to achieve the same level of free testosterone as people with really low totals. The factor that contributes to that is SHBG, sex hormone binding globulin. In a female, typically the sex hormone binding globulin, you want somewhere between 20 and 50, 20 and 60. And unfortunately, most females now we're testing end up with sex hormone binding globulin somewhere between 100 and greater than 200. Guess which group is greater than 200? It's the group that's on the oral estrogens. The group that's around 150 are the ones that have been off of birth control pills or off of oral estrogens for about three to five years. And they're still significantly elevated. They're not back down to this range. And so when you look at total testosterone, and you know, I'm going to use a, a, the labs like LabCorp. They use a range of about 6 to 82. Number one, 6 to 82 is an enormous range for testosterone levels. I mean, you can pick the person out in the room that would be 6 versus 82. This isn't like a narrow range like we have for sodium and potassium. This is a huge range. But the problem is it doesn't mean anything because it's based on how much bonding a person has. And there's a big difference between somebody who's 20 and somebody who's greater than 200 on their sex hormone binding globulin. We need to understand what that is. And the, the answer is right here, free testosterone. We need to know what that free testosterone is. That is the effective um, level that we're treating. We see excellent response at a certain level. And typically what I use, and when you're dealing with like uh, LabCorp and all that, I shoot for a range of somewhere between 1.5 and 3.5 or 4 on the free testosterone. Below 1.5, I really don't see much of a response. Above Four, I see side effects, acne, hair growth. Those are the, the downsides of the testosterone. I mean, you know, people ask me all the time, what are the risks? And, and what we're looking at is we're looking at a hormone that we know the body naturally does extremely well with. Um, body functions ideally with testosterone. That's the peak level when we're 21. We feel on top of the world. We can conquer the world. And we just let it drop because it's a natural part of aging. Well, so it's heart disease, but nobody objects to us going in and putting a stent in or, or treating the heart disease. Well, some people do, but anyway, it's a natural part of aging. Doesn't necessarily mean it's a healthy part of aging. So we like to keep this level in the healthy range, and we see awesome response when we get the patients in that range. Now, if you're using somebody like Quest, where they're doing uh, the testosterone in uh, picograms per ml. The, the ranges don't even correlate, I'll tell you. If you try to translate one range to another, uh, as far as the normal range, it doesn't work. But what I do is when I look at a, at a Quest lab, I multiply by 10 on the free testosterone. So their range on their free testosterone runs 0.1 to 6.4. Well, if you multiply that 
times 10, you're talking about a normal range of um, 1 to 6, and, or 1 to 64, actually. So it, it, doesn't, it just doesn't translate. Typically, what I look for on a free testosterone on a um, Quest Lab is I shoot for the 15 to 35 range. So basically 10 times what we have there. Um, and that's when, when it's being reported in picograms per ml versus nanograms per deciliter. Um, we have some patients that are from um, overseas, and theirs are always in nanomoles. So, you know, we have to translate this stuff all the time. And fortunately, I have a lot of experience in it, so I can, I can look at it and give an idea of, of what that is. Um, other things you want to look at, though, uh, estrogen. One of the things about testosterone is it works really well when the estrogen levels are normal. And it doesn't work as well when we're dealing with, with abnormal estrogens, especially in the postmenopausal women. It's much easier for me to manage someone by putting them on the estrogen and the testosterone rather than putting them on testosterone alone. And it throws a wrench in the works a little bit. It's just like that big symphony I was talking about. So we want to see this in the face of a fairly normal level of estrogen. Uh, we also want to look at LH and FSH because we want to know what the pituitary is doing. We want to look at the thyroid and not just TSH and total T4, total T3, T3 uptake. I want to see what the free T3 and free T4 is um, because the thyroid can have a profound effect on testosterone production as well. The other thing is cortisol. And cortisol is one of those things that's hard to really get a good grasp on. Um, we'll typically just do a screening with a, an AM cortisol to see where that is from the blood. Um, if we're really concerned about it, then we'll put people on a, um, a full day four point test of DHEA cortisol salivary test to see where that is, to see how much the cortisol is contributing. Because when you look at cortisol, cortisol can decrease LH, which decreases the stimulation to the ovaries. So it's feeding back on the pituitary, decreasing LH. It also ends up decreasing production of E2 directly. It will decrease production of progesterone. It will decrease production of testosterone. It will increase production of SHBG. So you get the point here. It's all bad stuff when the cortisol is too high. It's all causing lower and lower levels of the testosterone through different mechanisms. So it's important to understand that and, and keep it where it needs to be. The, um, the cortisol will also suppress dopamine production in the brain. So it makes everything less pleasurable. But predominantly, sexual interactions much less pleasurable. So we have a lot of females that will come in and they'll say, I just don't enjoy it. And one of the things that we see is when we get that testosterone back, not only are we getting an increase in desire, but we get an increase in function greater orgasmic uh, intensities and much more pleasure in building up to it. The brain just derives a great deal of pleasure when it has those hormones in the right situation. So um, what I wanted to do was take you through a couple of our patients to demonstrate what this does in a clinical situation because I can sit here all day and tell you about the biochemical physiology of it, but it doesn't mean anything to a lot of people until you actually see it in practice. And like I said, we've been doing testosterone replacement for about eight, nine years now in females. And so I picked a couple cases. Um, they're, they're fairly representative of our patient population, but they were ones that, that I thought would demonstrate well and, and come across uh, various age groups. The first case is a gal that came to us. She was 52 years old when she first came to us. Uh, she's postmenopausal. Uh, for several years. She had not been on hormone replacement until two years prior, and she was started on oral bioidentical uh, estrogen. Now, this is one of the things, I love bioidentical estrogen, but you can't give it in the oral form. It causes the same problems as the synthetic estrogens when you give it orally. You need to give it topically. It needs to absorb in the systemic circulation, not in the enteropathic circulation. So bioidentical hormones in the oral state are not safe when it comes to estrogen. Now, progesterone I'm okay with because it's micronized, but that's a different talk. Um, anyway, she came to us, 52 years old, and this was five years ago when she first presented with us. She had decreased muscle. 
She had decreased bone density. She had fatigue. She had poor sleeping habits. Couldn't fall asleep at night and couldn't get out of bed in the morning. She was hitting the snooze several times to get out of bed. Um, she had the brain fog. She had no sex drive whatsoever. She said, I just don't care if I have sex or not. And um, we did a DEXA body composition scan, which we do on all of our patients routinely each year and um, as frequently as we need to. That's where we discovered the decreased muscle mass. And she had a total body fat percentage of about 35% with 52% body fat in the gut. So the abdominal fat was 52%. This is a gal who's fairly athletic. She was uh, into CrossFit and uh, just wasn't making much progress with that either. That was another one of her uh, issues that she came with. What happened over the ensuing five years, and most of this occurs in the first couple months, and then we kind of maintain beyond that point, but she, she gained 11 pounds of muscle mass. I mean, a 52-year-old that gained 11 pounds of muscle mass, and she's maintained that, so she's 57 now. She's kept that 11 pounds of muscle mass that she gained. She dropped 14 pounds of fat mass at the same time. So she went from a body fat percentage of, uh, of 35% to 25%. Nice, healthy level. She went from 52% fat in the gut down to 33%. I mean, almost a 20% drop in the percentage of gut in the fat. That's huge. Talk about health benefits. That is enormous. Bone density went up 9%. But when she came, her total testosterone was 43. And that's on that scale of 6 to 82. So most physicians are going to look at that and say, oh, hey, that's great. You don't need anything. Well, when we looked at her free testosterone, it was 0 0.3. And remember, I like it between 1.5 and essentially 4. So she was really substantially low on her free testosterone. And the reason for that is her sex hormone binding globulin was 120. Guess what that was from? It was from the oral estrogen. That's what jacked up her sex hormone binding globulin. So she was binding up all this testosterone. The other thing is sex hormone binding globulin holds on to testosterone longer, so it makes it look like you have a lot more than what you're actually producing because it's not degraded at the same rate. So you can falsely look at it and say, oh, wow, they've got a huge amount of testosterone when they don't. It's just bound testosterone that's not being degraded quickly. It's like putting a, a dam on a river. It just builds up behind it. But her, te her free testosterone now runs about 2.7 on average. And like I said, over seven years, she's maintaining this. I mean, she is full of life. She sleeps well. She is doing things she never thought she would do before. She just started a blog um, and uh, talks about eating right and exercise and hormone replacement. So, you know, she is a uh, prime example of what can occur. I mean, people come to us all the time. And they're like, oh, you know, I'm in my 50s. What are you going to do for me? This is what we can do for you. Um, this is what testosterone can do for you and testosterone when it's used in a, in a way that takes advantage of what it's capable of doing. So let's look at another patient, a little bit younger patient. Uh, when she first came to us, uh, she was 48 years old. And this, this one, she was fairly fit, um, uh, pretty athletic uh, female. And she's been with us for six years now, so she's now uh, 54 years old. But when she first came to us, uh, she was postmenopausal and not on any estrogen. So she had not ever been on estrogen. She'd been on birth control 20 years earlier, but not currently on any estrogen. But she was having problems with fatigue, a uh, real major issue with decreased energy. And this was tough for her because she was fairly active, uh, athletic. Um, she had huge sleep disturbances, and she had, again, no libido. Um, and, th you know, that's an issue. Some people say, well, what's a normal libido? Well, you know, what was it like for you when you were 21, typically? Most of the time what we say a normal libido is a desire to have sex in a female that, that says maybe three to four times a week, that they have a desire to have sex. Not they have sex three times a week, but that they want to have sex three times a week. That's what we consider as a normal libido. And it doesn't matter if you're 20 years old or 70 years old. We have 75-year-old patients that are having sex five, six times a week, and they think anything less than that is abnormal. So everybody's a little different in that, but typically if you're not thinking about it and saying, hey, I really want that three times a week, then, then it's probably a little bit on the low side. Um, when she came, she had a low 
muscle mass. Um, and we calculate a lean body mass index, which uh, you can find out about that if you go to my blog and look up the sarcopenia post, how to calculate um, low muscle mass. It's called sarcopenia. Uh, but she had the sarcopenia. She had decreased bone density. Now, for her, she had 23% body fat, which most people would say, woohoo, I like that. That's awesome. I'd, I'd love to be 23% body fat and only 12% in the gut. So, you know. You say, oh, why does she need testosterone? She's just juicing. Well, no. She, we're not doing this for body composition standards. We're doing this for vitality. This is health we're talking about. This is not something that we're, we're juicing these people to say, hey, let's, let's all become bodybuilders. It's not going to happen, and none of my patients are like that. They don't get huge. Um, I mean, and females are always afraid. They come in and they say, well, I don't want to get big muscles. Well, you're not going to get big muscles. Even when you're treated, you're one-tenth of what a male is. I mean, female bodybuilders are doing 10 times these doses. This isn't something that, that we do. Um, and that's not what testosterone replacement is about. But anyway, you know, her numbers look pretty good there, but she just didn't feel good. And when we checked her, her labs, her testosterone was only 18. So her primary problem was a major production issue of testosterone. She only had a sex hormone binding globulin um, of 40. So she was in the normal range on the sex hormone binding globulin. Again, she hadn't been on any estrogens. Uh, and really nothing else in her numbers that indicated that. And she was 0 0.4 on her free testosterone. Again, this is where we want it, 1.5 to 4. So she was a uh, quarter to a tenth, somewhere in that range of where she needed to be. Um, what we found with her is dramatic increases in energy. Um, she was sleeping better. Her libido was awesome. Um, her husband was very grateful. And what we saw happen with her body composition is she went from 23% to 12% total body fat. I mean, this is an athletic build. And this is six years later she's at this. So she went to 12%. She's got 8% in the gut. And her free testosterone level now runs 2.2. So you can see these aren't outrageous levels that we're achieving. but we're getting great results. Now, her biggest problem, she had a lot of fat in the hips. She was 36% in the hips, and she went down to 23% in the hips um, with the treatment. And she went up 3% in her bone density in the uh, six years. And this is without being treated with the bisphosphonates, these, these bonevas, the, the drugs that are really nasty on the body that really don't do a whole lot for bone density. I mean, take your vitamin D3, do your testosterone, and do your uh, resistance training. That's the way to increase that bone density. So the next patient, 42-year-old when she came to see us, and this was seven, almost eight years ago. 42-year-old. The year prior to coming to us, she had gone an abdominal hysterectomy and had basically felt like her life had ended with the hysterectomy. She had no energy. She had no sleep pattern whatsoever. She'd wake up in the middle of the night. She couldn't fall asleep. She couldn't get out of bed in the morning. Uh, she had no drive, nothing left, and zero libido. Uh, didn't care if she ever had sex again, and really wanted to have the feeling that she wanted to, but she didn't. Um, huge decrease in vitality and drive. Um, that was one of the biggest things we noticed with her is her drive went through the roof, uh, started a new career, um, just changed every aspect of her life once she got the, the hormones balanced. Um, memory was another major issue for her, that brain fog and the fact that she couldn't remember anything. This is all after the hysterectomy, so it was not a problem prior to that time. Uh, and she wasn't on any hormones at the time. They were talking about putting her on uh, some uh, Premarin or Prempro when she first came to see us because she was afraid to do that. Uh, and this is a woman who was very athletic. She came to us with 22% body fat. And over the first six months of her treatment, she dropped down to 11% body fat. 
and her gut dropped from 15% body fat to 8% in the gut. Um, and she was thrilled to death. She's maintained that. So, you know, she, she was actually 40 when she came to see us, and she's been with us for seven years. Uh, so she had her hysterectomy at 39, fairly young for that. Um, but she went from a size 8 to a size 2, and that was a result of increasing muscle mass by 12 pounds and decreasing fat mass by 12 pounds. Her weight didn't change. But she went from 22% to 11%. She went from a size 8 dress to a size 2 zero, and has maintained that for seven years. So it was awesome the way that uh, she came through. Quality of life improved dramatically, um, and she is thrilled to death with, with her results with this. Um, and I can't imagine her ever letting anybody take the testosterone away from her, uh, honestly. So let's talk about somebody who's younger. Um, how about a 33-year-old? Believe it or not, we do see patients in their 30s that require treatment. This gal came to us, and this is a, this is a fairly recent patient, but um, I wanted to include her because of uh, some aspects of, of her case. Um, major issues, fatigue, decreased uh, sex drive, and she was couldn't figure out why she couldn't make any progress in the gym. She was working her tail off. I mean, this is a type A uh, gal. And she was just driven to do these things, but not getting results, so she was losing her drive. Um, so with her, she'd been on birth control pills since she was 16 years old, still taking them at the time she came to see us. And so we did some, some labs on her. And her testosterone level four. Four. I mean, that's her total testosterone was four. On top of that, her sex hormone binding globulin, which again, you know, we want that somewhere between 20 and 60. Her sex hormone binding globulin was 188. And what was that from? Half of her life being on birth control pills. Um, her free testosterone was unmeasurable. It was less than 0.01. So this was a woman who was essentially existing with no testosterone whatsoever. Um, she was someone who carried a lot of weight in her hips, and, and it bothered her. She wanted to get rid of the, of the fat in her hips. And she was 25% body fat. Again, you know, it's not bad. It's not a bad place to be. I mean, she's certainly not obese. But she wasn't happy with that. And it's not the healthiest place to be. Well, in two months, she went from 25% to 16% body fat, total body fat. Her gut started off at 17.3. And in two months, 9.6%. She gained. Eight pounds of muscle and lost eight pounds of fat in two months. Um, did it simultaneously. Um, she is full of life now. She is enjoying the gym, making amazing progress in the gym. She is thrilled with the way her clothes are fitting her. Um, her vitality is amazing. And she actually just did one of those uh, tough mutters. And this is a girl you never would have expected that from, but she's amazing. Uh, just when she puts the efforts into it, uh, she gets the results now. And a lot of this comes down to the fact that she was on those birth control pills. Um, how long would it take to correct that without supplementation? Years. Um, she put herself behind the eight ball with that, uh, not any fault of her own. Uh, she was just listening to uh, what the conventional wisdom was in the medical community, and that's what got her into that position. So, um, you know, f for people that are wondering about this, have the blood work done. Go to your doctor, ask them to do the right blood work. Make sure they get a total testosterone, a sex hormone binding globulin, and a free testosterone. Free testosterone is absolutely essential. Um, Testosterone replacement in females is not 
this thing that's in the closet that people don't talk about anymore. Uh, if you look in the last year, it's been huge articles, positive articles in the Huffington Post. Um, Oprah, uh, her website did a huge article on um, testosterone replacement. The medical literature is finally coming around to doing the studies that have tested females for uh, testosterone deficiencies instead of leaving it into the realm of the men. So uh, get yourself tested if you're having the symptoms. Thanks. <laughs>